streaming music has been uh, one of the real growth stories of 2015. We've seen Spotify hit new heights. We've seen uh, Apple Music come into the market. YouTube do better than it's ever done before. Uh, and you know, there's a huge amount of press coverage, and media interest, and attention around streaming. One of the bits of crucial, um, one of the crucial elements of, of the growth of streaming that hasn't as got the headlines as much is the role that telcos play. So telco bundles are, have been crucially important in the role in the role of the growth of streaming for, for years now. Uh, is super important when rolling out to new markets, but even in mature markets as well, we're seeing new generations of, of, of deals being struck and, and a much more sort of uh, mature, more sophisticated approach to what a relationship should look like between telcos and streaming services. So far, both parties seem to be doing pretty well out of it. In fact, all three parties, the labels and the publishers as the rights holders, the telcos and the music services, they all get something out of it. But there are competing objectives, there are uh, different priorities, and there are tensions across the value chains as well. So what we're going to talk about today is looking at where we're at with, with streaming bundles now. You know, what, what have we achieved so far? Uh, what have been the models of success? What needs to change, if anything, going forward? We'll also talk a bit about emerging markets, about um, alternative pricing models. Uh, and then sort of really looking at what may be like a, a utopian type of a relationship between telcos, labels, and streaming services, what would that look like? So I'm joined here by a, uh, uh, people from right across the value chain. So we've, well, let them each introduce themselves, but we've got Michael from Spotify, we've got Cicel from Telenor, we've got Brian from ATC Management, and we've got Alfonso from Warner Music. But uh, what we'll do to get you introduced, if you could each spend no more than about a minute talking about yourself, but just say one really interesting thing about streaming music to throw into the mix, whatever it can be. This is your chance to go left field or st stay on topic. Something that's going to say something about yourself through the words of streaming. Oh, <laughs> God. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Abatista. I run Spotify's uh, telecom and ISP business. One, sh one interesting thing about streaming music, hmm, I don't know, Mark. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's exploding. It's exploding. Um, just a quick 20 seconds on where Spotify is with telecom partnerships. We have over 40 partnerships around the world. Uh, we work with everybody from um, Vodafone in multiple markets, Telia, Telefonica. It's become uh, a very big business for us. Um, and yeah, it's, there's a lot of green field out there. We had in a lot of ways, a lot of ways we ha haven't even gotten started. OK, great. Cecil. Hi, I'm Cecil from Telenor. One interesting thing about streaming, I think I try now to evangelize everybody else to start streaming. Mm -hmm. I had my first mobile streaming experience in 2004. That right. was pretty early, mm -hmm. no mass market. OK. Brian. Um, hi, I'm Brian. I'm an uh, artist manager. Um, and our business manages about 40 acts. Uh, we're also a talent booker, so we, met, we book about 200 artists to perform. Uh, my interesting thing about, about streaming, I'm going to tip my hat to Spotify here, because every morning now, since the beginning of the year, I wake up every day and uh, I look at our artists' Spotify profiles, and I look at who's listening to all of our acts all over the world, country by country, uh, and look at trends and can compare them with our acts. And, uh, as a nerdy accountant, I love that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Alfonso. Yeah, thank you. Alfonso Perez Soto. And, um, I manage business development for Latin region and emerging markets for Warner Music. And um, the world, we have uh, 7.2 uh, 7 billion people, and only 1.3% 1. 1. have uh, music streaming services. Uh, most of the ones that are not over there are in my territory. So I'm really excited and I you know, get up uh, very happy in the morning finding the way how to bring music to all that people. Brilliant. OK, so <clears throat> just before we get stuck in, if you don't already know the, uh, the, the, the score, if you want to submit questions, you go to mmix.com and you'll see the option there to submit questions and they'll come through to this iPad here and we'll be able to fill the questions at the end. So just put those in as we go along. And if you've got anyone you want to ask particular questions to, just put their name before it as well. So we've got uh, around about 11 million 
music telco bundles live at the moment in terms of actual su uh, subscribers. Um, not all of those are active, but you know, it's a, it's a good sizable chunk. It's give or take between a fifth and a quarter of the total base of music subscribers. It's a really significant share. The number of live partnerships is growing massively. So <clears throat> from around 40 odd in 2013 to well over 100 now. So there's clearly lots of activity. Um, and we've got much more brand awareness and all those sorts of things. Now, Michael, going from 40 to 100 partnerships live, Spotify is a huge number of those. Um, how full-time a gig is it for Spotify? I know it's a full-time gig for you and your department, but for Spotify as a whole, you know, just how, how, how big a deal are tel telco bundles? Well, to give you an idea, we have 25 people currently dedicated to nothing but telco and ISP partnerships, and that covers everything from, that's not even including legal and licensing. This is just people, everybody from people who source the deals and actually uh, negotiate the deals to the implementation people involved, the account management. So we have... Uh, you know, a whole separate business, uh, a whole separate business unit dedicated to these partnerships, yeah. separate from our BD department. Okay, and Cicel, from the from the uh, the operator's perspective, is this more of a focus now than it was, or is it, or are you getting distracted by things like video and you know all the other nice shiny new things that are happening in the digital economy? Yeah, a lot of focus on video as well. Uh, I think telcos have a long history of actually engaging uh, directly with uh, labels and the music business and uh, from the early start of mobile entertainment and uh, from ringtones and ringback tones and so on. Then it has been probably an era, at least uh, in our business, uh, Telenor operates in the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, then Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, of our 200 million subscribers, 150 million of those, they are in Asia. So we are a big operator in, a, in the emerging and developing Asian markets. And we see that um, uh, music is a, it's a big portion of our uh, entertainment services. So what you could probably uh, look at for a point in time that maybe it was lesser focus on music, I see now that... Uh, and maybe that's also the reason why I'm here, that we have increased focus on music again. Uh, we have tested and tried many different business models. We're getting to that, I know, in this panel, but uh, we also see that we, we can play a different role and uh, support the music industry and uh, legal digital services, digital okay. music services. So, Brian, I'm going to skip you because I've got a yeah. slightly different version of the question for you. <laughs> so, Alfonso, in terms of the commercial focus of, of, of Warner. So do you see, is, are you seeing that telco bundles are uh, still pretty much the same level of importance they had a couple of years ago, or do you, is it changing? Well, telco bundles now more or less are 18% of the total pay subscribers mm -hmm. worldwide. I think that the, that percentage has been actually decreased from previous year. Um, I think that is about a, a, a the explosion of uh, uh, markets in the emerging markets where uh, bundles are not so easy to made in the same way that was done in Western Europe. Why? More challenging are push prepay base. So we have to make the adjustment. Mm -hmm. We have to make the adjustments in the way that we, uh, um, the carrier, you know, charge to the subscriber, maybe even the content that is delivered, creating a, a maybe a mid-size offer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the only way that I think that we are going to get this big, um, uh, big amount of uh, users, music lovers, but uh, that they have in an ARPU between 9 and $16. So current bundles as Western Europe uh, uh, that work very well even though work in, in the countries that are growing the most. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Brian, just how much does the difference between streaming bundles versus streaming as a whole actually register in most artists uh, as a views of the market? I would say probably not at all. Yeah. Uh, and I think for us as the, you know, the business half of that partnership with an artist where we're trying to monetize and build artist careers, uh, the key thing for us is just making sure that the 
the music, the language of that business gets as far and wide as possible. Look, we like to monetize it, obviously, but as a primary thing, uh, the wider we can, we can see that music go and the, the more we can get data back as to what's going on for our, for our artists, then um, that's, a, that's our primary concern. So if, if Music Bundles helps make that get there, for us, that's a good thing. So I suppose you're balancing out as well two things. One is the, the great exposure which streaming mm. services get as a result of being on telco services, mm -hmm. which then drives consumption, which gets artists seen more. But coupled with the fact that often the rates which a telco will be paying are going to be different than for a standard 999 service. So would you say that the benefits of reach for an artist outweigh the potential hit that yeah, you take? Yeah, 100% for evening? us. Because right. uh, we, 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 uh, we monetize in, in many, many different ways and in many different ways, territory by territory. So when you're building those type of businesses, it, you need the reach and the, you need that reach. You know, go back to the point about looking at the Spotify data. That's very useful for us in terms of how we build our touring schedules. Right. Uh, and it's not just Spotify data, it's, it's, it's across the board. But the more of that sort of data we get in, the better we can manage the revenue flows to coming into each of the artist businesses that we operate. Yeah. So it's, it's obviously different for you, Alfonso, because Warner only get to participate in a small amount of those main ways that artists make their money. You, know, it's, you only take a tiny part of live and merch, and nearly everything's in the recorded music pot. So, what, how do you balance out that, that sort of tension where in order to do the telco deals, you're, t you're looking at discounted rates and whatever else it is to help get that service to market versus this long-term goal of building you know, the size of the audience? Oh, I got a difficult question, I guess. Yeah. Um, look, well, you know that um, we, I mean, our CEO announced that our pledge for music, mm. so this is obviously one way that uh, we are addressing this. Um, the other is like uh, we have to have a good balance between one uh, in our decisions, you know, because uh, the reality is we need to basically expand the market. As I said, we are just scratching the, the surface and I think it's going to be in the big benefit of every, everyone in the chain that we make this work, you know, um, the more streams, the more revenue, the more that we can facilitate a, 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 a revenue com coming from advertisers on the free part and also in the pay part, um, um, try to obviously integrate the carrier uh, and the carrier billing. And uh, that is going to make the business grow. And if the business grow, we'll go for everyone. Yeah. Would I, would I be fair or unfair to say if you were going to select a hierarchy of um, your preferred partners, number one is direct to consumer, Number two is telco, and number three is, is free as ways of growing the streaming audience. Well, that is to consumer. It seems the, 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 the one that uh, from Spotify, the standalone offer, or other partners is working uh, the best so far. Uh, it's what, uh, what mm -hmm. the data says, you know. Um, the preference, I think that uh, we have to be very careful when we pick, make choices, because um, what we learn it's like a, we started with all these global deals and global solutions. Um, and basically, we did it because we need to try to provide services to everyone and fight piracy mm. in many ways. However, I think that we are reaching the point that we have to localize and, and be uh, um, thinking about the local needs, put a, a, a boots in the ground um, um, with our partners, and try to adjust but whatever needs to be done in each, in each market. So I think there's this really, this is, this is a really good point. There's this interesting thing which is emerging. Now that we've got so much more of the world is coming online, whether that be via the traditional web or via mobile, so we are truly talking about digital global audiences for the first time. Yet we're also beginning to hear people say that there's no such thing as a global audience. So um, BuzzFeed's uh, CMO recently said, he doesn't want anybody to ever tell him there's a global advertising market. There isn't one. You have to do things so differently everywhere you are. So, Cicel, you, you, know, you focus on a really wide range of different sort of markets. What, how, how, what is the right sort of approach versus you've got these big services like Spotify, which have a global footprint, lots of local specialization within them, but you know, global players, versus going with indigenous local services like in your re regions, you focus on like KKBox, et cetera. What, uh, what's the right balance between those? Do, do both of them have a role to play, or is it...? The short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, 
Of course, in, in the very mature markets, we see that it's lesser uh, services that dominate. It's, uh, of course, mature markets in terms of, uh, you know, Scandinavian markets. And uh, there are, uh, you know, a few local players. If you move uh, to Asian region where I'm based, it's um, new uh, regional services uh, popping up. Also, even on a local level, there are also a lot of radio apps and a lot of different music services coming and uh, I th uh, my personal belief is that these will very much coexist a uh, few of the good ones that are catering for potentially very local uh, musical behavior or um, live and digital uh, experiences that you you may have in each local market at the same time as you also have uh, a very uh, large portion of the market also wanting to have a global service like uh, Spotify and, and those alike. So in, in markets where we are now experimenting and having some good, uh, good uh, results already, we see that it's a good mix between global players and regional players side by side. Okay, because <clears throat> we're seeing one, one of the problems, and you know, Alfonso is talking about this uh, early on, we, we've got this tension with streaming where the vast majority of the audience is free but the majority of the revenue is coming from this tiny little sub-segment. Now, most of that audience, and it's not so much in the Spotify model where actually the ratio between free and paid is, is much better than a market level. But a market level, because of YouTube mainly, but also because of SoundCloud a lot as well, the vast majority of streaming is free. So it's about how do you drive people to pay. So there's a been, it's much easier to get to that sort of ceiling of adoption of your first 10% in any market. So that's, you know, so, and so there's a, quite a line grab going on for emerging markets where companies like Spotify and Deezer are all looking at, well, these are the other markets. Let's go and get those early adopters quickly in those other markets while we most gradually mature mm. these established markets. You look at the US, Pandora has seen its market capitalization collapse and a whole load of you know, issues with its share price and everything else because it's a slow growth curve now in the US. It's reached it, and so it's probably going to have to look at an international story to tell. So when you look at, you know, sort of say, you know, the Middle East, you've got uh, services like Angami, which is sort of catered for local content. You've got QQ uh, uh, in, in China. You've got Savan in India. All these catering for the... To what extent can, you know, a com company like Spotify compete with those specialists, you know, who, who, who will know the, their markets inside out, who will have the relationships with the local... Uh, labels and they'll have the expertise and, the, and the, the credibility. How can Spotify go in is what will be seen, ironically, as this big American company probably to most of the, you know, the rest of the world? Oh, it, it's challenging and that's why we really do have to be local in the markets that we launch in. And that's why you know, Spotify is live in 58 markets and we won't launch in a market unless we really feel we can win there locally. You know, we're not really interested in launching someplace just to say, hey, we're live. So, it's challenging, and it's you know obviously it's a combination of the product being localized, the content, the the types of deals we have, the the offer that we have can't just it's very very hard to just bolt on a 9.99 Northern European bundle into a, a telco that's 98 percent prepaid. Yeah. So it's so it's it's the second time we've heard about prepay. So let, let's quickly and I have prepay right down at the bottom of the list. I'll bring it right up. So. Before we go into this in detail, how important, and anyone can take this, how important is pre-to-pay in the established markets? We, it's clearly there's a massive demand for it in the emerging markets, and we'll talk about that in some detail in a moment. But in the, you know, the, in the Western markets like the UK and in Italy, which are big pre-pay audiences, maybe a little less so in the US, but how, is, is that an opportunity waiting to be tapped? I think it is. I think the opportunity of prepaid is in the developed markets as well, because the reality is more and more, um, if you just look at the US, a lot of contracts are going away. So in a lot of countries, you are going to this sort of consumption model, this usage model. And I think even if there might be a big postpaid base in places like the US and the UK, there's still a lot of people who want to pay a month at a, month at a time. And I think you're seeing more people than not going in that direction as opposed to contracts. So there's so there's so few services which can properly do weekly or daily billing. You know, you sort of there's that uh, music cube that have been pushing with with MTV tracks, trying to get this sort of low price point and looking at ways to do that with prepay. You've got personas doing their sort of a, you know the penny a stream, but there's very little if you look at it in terms of actual pricing. Now, 
I know from talking to lots of these services, because we work with lots of these services, they're saying, we want to do more, the labels won't let us do more. The, you know, the labels are scared of cannibalizing the top table and everything else. And I'm, I promise not to turn this into a label bashing panel. That's not the intention. <laughs> but to what extent, what are the reasons for, for having to sometimes be the one who says, well, look, we need to think more carefully about the way that we, we tier our pricing and we unbundle, et cetera? What? Well, first of all, um, the, I would say that the Mercedes-Benz of the service, the full interactive three devices. Um, the reality, uh, one of the solutions that we found uh, in emerging market territories is a, a charging per week mm -hmm. instead of per month. And that is very important, for example, to work very close with the carrier because they can, they can integrate uh, smart billing. They can, uh, you know, try to find a way that always, you know, charge the, uh, the, the, the subscriber when he has credit. I think that one, what, that was pretty successful in some markets like, for example, Brazil, you know? Um, but that's true. I think that it could be a mid-size. I think that uh, there is a room for a mid-size product that uh, uh, can provide a, a, a really good sense of an access to music with playlists, with uh, catching, and, uh, and being a service that is in the middle. But uh, I think that... Uh, um, it's not about us to protect or not protect uh, 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 the access to the service. It's, it's uh, uh, providing and preserving the, the value and, and being able to bring people to the, to the paid services as well, and because we don't want to leave anybody behind. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the problems about going after those, the mainstream mass market music fan who currently at the moment gets virtually everything from Spotify or the, uh, from YouTube, not Spotify. You know, so the challenge is, is that those are mainstream consumers who are casual in their mm -hmm. music taste and they don't necessarily spend much, if anything, on, mu on music. How can you, how, it's a much easier sell to somebody who loves music and used to buy albums every week to go and say, hey, here's a 999 music service. How do you sell to those, to those customers? Yeah. I think you're hitting it on the head. The, the prepaid challenge is not just the telco partnership challenge. It is, I think, the biggest challenge facing the music industry because there really isn't a way to pay for music the way people pay for, um, uh, you know, if you think about the way people pay for things in a lot of these countries, it's not, it's not recurring billing. It's, again, it's a day at a time. It's uh, maybe a week at a time. And it's not, it's everything our model isn't. It's not recurring. It's not predictable. It's very, you know, if you can get a little money this month, you get it from them. And I think the music business, we have a long way to go to try to come anywhere to present our product in a way that people actually will pay for it yeah. in a lot of these markets. So some of you may be familiar with the, uh, in the UK, Sky have launched a, uh, a service called Now TV. And so Now TV is trying to get solve this exact problem for, for TV subscriptions. So it will give you a pass. It will give you a pass to a sporting event or to movies or, or et cetera. And, and I think that it takes a lot of education to do that. And it, you know, it, I firmly believe it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, share your, your view on this, Michael, that it's the next biggest problem that the industry needs to fix. The great irony is that the music industry already had this model. It was called the download store. And then that's been getting killed off now. So look, we're interested in your, your view here, Brian, because with downloads, it's doubly impactful for artists because artists made a lot more money up front, depending on whether they recouped and everything else. But, you know, conceptually, had much more predictable revenue from downloads. Mm -hmm. And now we're moving to this access-based model. Does that mean for for you know, at least the artists that you're working with, it's really accelerating this view that you know, to not get so hung up on music income from recorded music anymore and see it much more as a marketing platform. Well, I think for many years now, you know, the recorded music uh, element of what an artist does is a, is a very small part of the pie. Uh, so go back to that point again, it's, it is, it, but it's the language of an artist's business. So it's really critical from the perspective of driving other other commerce, that's for sure. Um, but you know, it's it's yeah. It's been, I would say it's probably been that it's been that way now for 10, 15 years or so. Where at some level, if you, certainly if you sign to a, a record deal, your expectation is always you'll get some funding for your record and you'll get your advance, etc. But realistically, you're not going to get anything more than that. So you're using that really as an opportunity to build. Mm. Uh, so I think you know again. 
I would say that's the, that's the primary element. It's that recorded music piece is more yeah. the language rather than an economic return. And, you know, that might change over time, yeah. and it's not the same for all artists, that's for sure. Um, but where you have uh, acts who have got multiple disciplines and, and are prepared to monetize in many different ways, that's, a, that's not un, it's, it's quite a usual mix. So, and I'm just, just going to take a very quick deviation here because I think it's, it's an important an interesting angle to follow. So if we've got artists who are already much more f flexible about the way that they view the recorded music careers, mm. um, and in the context of on-demand services, you don't have to fill any format and anything else, why haven't we seen streaming services really let artists, seeing artists using streaming services be much more uh, adventurous about what they do, delivering instead of delivering an album all at once, putting it out here and there, or do, having song lengths, you know, maybe doing lots more vine length songs for some artists and whatever else. Is that just because of the record label commercial structures, or is uh, our artists not, still not comfortable no, not, with doing that? I wouldn't say so. I think it's just more of a prioritization, you know. And I think when we first started talking to the Spotify guys early, early on, and at some level the YouTube guys early on, understandably those businesses were trying to build their business. So prioritizing what we're all talking about now was, was, was very much down the page. Now we're starting to see it go further up the page, and I think we're starting to see much more reach coming from the Spotify's, the YouTube's, the Twitter's, etc., to the artist community, wanting that stickability of what artists can provide, etc. But I think, you know, as they were building their businesses, understandably, they kind of had other priorities to get on with. Right, okay. Yes. I would like to add that marketing is no uh, easier today than it used in the past. Actually, I think uh, uh, in many ways that is uh, even more difficult because um, your audience is diluted, you know, and um, goes to different social media and you have to find it. And you have to, we have tools that we didn't have in the past and uh, obviously we can try to find them and try to, you know, uh, when we have a big release, you know, try to put the record on the right audience. But, uh, you know, marketing is not easy. Mm. And second, one thing that is important, that is, uh, uh, is a big benefit for all, all the artists, is like, uh, at the end of the day, we are becoming a network. Our channels in, 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 in YouTube, for example, we are a network, a network of uh, artists and, and content. Mm. And, uh, and uh, we help, obviously, being part of that network helps uh, all the artists that are within, you know? Okay. Um, and just before I move on to the next question, so there's one thing you're talking about, you know, the network that you're part of. In many ways, Warner is a unique, unique for the big labels in that you've got all these other parts which are within the access industry sort of framework and the, you know, strong links, you know, with Deezer, but with artist management. And how important do you think, and I'm not going to ask you unless you want to sort of specifically about, you know, how the, the companies work together, but how important do you think this idea of a record label's long-term business is having working much more as part of a network, much more as part of feeding into sister companies, et cetera, rather than being what it used to be 10, 15 years ago as this sort of great big pillar that would stand on its own? Well, um, I think that um, we are becoming a media company. Mm. If you see the amount of streamings and the followers that we have in YouTube, in social media, so what we are is learning how to act as a media company. And um, in some territories, we are more active than in others, but um, we are um, selling, a, for example, premium advertising in YouTube. We are a, obviously with the 360 rights that we have for different artists, we're trying to you know, be much more active at securing those uh, 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 rights and bringing business to our artists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is the path that I think that we have to follow because uh, at the end of the day, um, users are looking for our music and our artists. And um, wherever it is, is more or less, you know, effective for them in terms of uh, whatever, you know, is uh, covering the, the content. But they're looking for, you know, the content at the end of the day. Cicel, one of the things which has always fascinates me about telcos working with music is it's practically impossible for a telco to make direct money out of the actual music deal itself. You know, when everybody's taking their bit and it's already a low margin business in the first place, and by the time you spent your money in marketing it and implementing it and doing your tech integration and everything else. They, Don't tell them. 
So, yeah. <laughs> so, why do, you, why do telcos keep coming back for more and more? Very good question. Um, I think originally we started, at least on the streaming business, we started to use it much more as a differentiator, so a marketing tool. And uh, obviously then you get funds from different sources than making money. So it's, um, uh, it's funded by how you want to, to uh, put forward a specific offering, particularly uh, in the post-bed segment, you, you put together an offering that includes a music streaming service. Now, I think that we are about at least to, to change the view uh, of that because we see that for us to stimulate a very, at least uh, in the large prepaid markets, now I mentioned prepaid again, um, we see that we are actually uh, putting together offers that are quite expensive for us with minimum guarantees, marketing commitment, and so on, uh, that actually only targets a very small portion of our customers. So for us, we have uh, also looked at how can we change that model and how can we help still the music uh, service providers and uh, industry to, to uh, stimulate growth. So we, we have now changed somewhat the model to look at what are our objectives. Mm -hmm. We want obviously to drive mobile data and mobile internet usage and stimulate growth on that. And we see music is, of course, a mass market appeal. It still is what I would say, you mentioned music lovers. I think that what we saw from some of our market research, we could estimate that 50% of uh, some of the, the markets that we've been working with, uh, like in Malaysia and so on, 50% are music lovers. So uh, if we think that 50% of the population have more than an active relationship to this category of entertainment, obviously we need to do something about it. But we can't just be putting a marketing uh, offer to a very small portion of that market. Yeah. So we have changed models to look at how can we also uh, work uh, with uh, Spotify, with uh, different uh, uh, service providers to put together also an offering that stimulates large take up for the, the prepaid markets. And of course, this is back to, you, you mentioned some music service providers like uh, Peace Owner, MTV Tracks, and so on, putting together premium services for the prepaid market. I believe that we need to do much more also on the freemium model and to stimulate the, the, the total base much larger so we're not just catering for a very small portion. So one thing that I think it's valid to share is that we did, uh, we did a lot of market research and we asked them, what are you doing? How do you consume music? And those that mentioned streaming, they mentioned YouTube. So audio streaming, video streaming, it was the same for them in emerging markets. So they all are already on a freemium model. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't, uh, the, the biggest threat that we saw was that it was YouTube mentioned and then of course all the illegal pirated services that you have in, in Asia. It could be that it's legal services in China, but illegal in our markets. And then, of course, a lot of piracy. We even saw piratebay.se from Sweden being one of the very popular ones in Malaysia. Uh, and we saw that we needed to actually uh, secure that we have uh, uh, legal services. And I think we have still a lot to do together to work on freemium models, but also upselling to you know small uh, smaller bite-sized pricing on premium uh, premium services, being that uh, weekly passes or weekend passes or two hours uh, without uh, ads, knowing also that emerging markets they are they are not so they don't feel that advertising is as intrusive as maybe in some of the Western markets. So maybe it's uh, to have uh, offline mode. Maybe it's other other services that would be a premium value to that segment. Mm -hmm. So we have changed from the business objectives as well as how we work on the, on the model. So we changed from working with, for instance, a single vendor, I call it vendor, because we, we, it was money transaction setup, to a much more multi-partner setup, mm -hmm. where we also invite different music uh, providers to come in and, and uh, see how we can develop that together. Okay. A very long answer, yeah. sorry about that. No, no, <coughs> useful, so, so building that, Michael. The, 
two, two, two parts to this question, please. One, what have you seen? So Cicel there is talking about how priorities and objectives have changed. How much do you see change elsewhere within telco partners in, in, in a more, some, not just in emerging markets, but in, in you know, the more mature markets? What, how are their objectives changing? And then the second part of the question, if you sort of tie it in with it as well, is what do you think are the most important things that the telcos bring to you in a partnership? Sure. I think one change is that three years ago, I think the primary reason that most telcos wanted to work with Spotify was uh, more, it was more about differentiation, it was about customer acquisition, it was about any brand uplift that they might get from working with a company like ours. That's still true, but I think that there's more of a focus now on retention. I mean, especially with us, a lot of our deals are, you know, we've had four years now. Our oldest one, we're in our seventh year, and so for them it's about They've already differentiated, and now they're about, okay, is this going to help us you know, you know, keep, our, keep our subscribers, especially if, there's no, if they're moving away from contracts. They need things to keep people in more than ever. So I'd say re retention has become a bigger focus. Um, what was the second part of the question? What are the most valuable things that telcos bring to oh. It still comes down, I would say, to uh, it still comes down to distribution as number one. And when I say distribution, you know, we... When we do deals, we hope to be offered across you know, the widest variety of, of tariffs that a company has. You know, very, all of our most successful deals have wide distribution. It's not just a music tariff that's available to only some people over here. It's their strategic alignment from the top down. And um, to your point, it's not about, for all of our successful partners, it's not about revenue. It has a strategic importance to them. And there's a, t there's a top down approach that, hey, we're going to use music as a fundamental component of what we offer, whether it's their 4G services, whether it's their prepaid, wh whatever they're working on, it has to be um, widely distributed for us. And then, of course, marketing, the marketing that uh, telcos still bring. Um, I sense that, I do sense that there is. Um, maybe a trend towards more direct, below-the-line type activities, uh, CRM, t CRM type stuff as opposed to the big ATL stuff that still happens. But again, it's, it's hard when telcos do big ATL campaigns with a company like Spotify. It tends to be very, um, it, it might be loud, but the nuance of what Spotify is is obviously not necessarily captured. And then when you have a free tier and a paid tier, it's really not captured. So I think it's distribution, marketing, what am I forgetting? There's probably one more thing in there that okay. it's... Oh, by the way, oh, billing, I'm sorry. So in a lot of markets, you know, especially where credit card penetration is low, having carrier billing is hugely important. Yeah. <clears throat> well, carrier billing also has a really good knack of increasing your lifetime value for all those people who forget to opt out. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So the, one of the things I'm interested to hear about is the... It's, it's eased off a little bit, but we've had for, you know, for, for years now with streaming, huge amount of uh, uh, lots of debate from artists and songwriters about um, you know, whether they're getting fairly paid and whether the, you know, the models, uh, there's transparencies there, etc. That, you know, that, that always happens when a new technology comes along. You know, the, the change is difficult and scary and people you know, always get shaken out of their comfort zones. And so, there are lots of very important, valid concerns that still need to be addressed, but people are beginning to get a bit more used to, to streaming as part of, the, you know, part of their daily music world. Are there any elements of the challenges which still exist for streaming that telco bundles can help fix? You know, any of those tensions across the value chain? Does anybody want to have a go at that? It's not an easy one to answer, and I'm not sure I could p pick anything out as being really solid, but it's just, it's, you know, we've got the things which still don't add up. We still don't have, uh, you know, for the majority of artists, it's not replacing the amount of money that they're getting back from sales. You know, we're in a position where uh, people are seeing, uh, you know, their audiences are fragmenting. So, all, you know, are there any of these issues which bundles can help fix? It, our telco partnerships, they tend to bring in a new audience. Um, we do a pretty good job of getting to our sweet spot, which are millennials. Um, you know, we skew very 29 and under. And, you know, half of, half of the people that come to, um, that come to a Spotify telco bundle are brand new to Spotify, right. which is you know, still a huge thing for us. So we know these are, they're either brand new, and then there's a, a huge percentage on top of that that are coming from our free tier. So this is a, still a big way to not just get scale, but to get maybe a little bit older audience, maybe an audience that has heard of us, but needs that little extra push to, and, and it's directly into our premium service, which is awesome because you know, they're, getting, they're getting hooked on the, the features right away, on the best stuff. 
and hopefully they'll be more, more likely to stay around. So we might have to try a little harder to get them, but then we find out when we get them, they're um, less apt to churn. Right. Uh, if I heard your question correct, I think one of the interesting things that could happen is, is really aiding discovery and discovery of new music. And, the, and not having, you know, obviously there's an understandable reason why people flock to the superstar acts, um, but actually aiding the discovery of new music and new audiovisual. Obviously, that we live in such a big audiovisual world, and I'd say probably I'm spending most of my time on filmmaking with our artists, whether that's six-second clips to full feature lengths, uh, the whole spectrum of it. But getting to that point where there's discover of new talent and, and discover of new music, because there, there is an extraordinary explosion, to my mind, of great creativity right, uh, right across the board. Technology has enabled people to create like n never before, and enabling uh, if telcos and platforms can combine to help make that discovery as easy as possible, so then that would be great. Do you, could, could you foresee a, a streaming services essentially becoming proper music platforms. So platforms where artists do most of the interaction with their fans around, mm -hmm. discover you know, where I'm playing, here's you know, the merch yeah. you can buy from me, have a look at how we're working on the new album, or yeah. are artists going to want to still keep a lot of that stuff in places they own themselves? Uh, no, I don't think so. And I think you know, part of that sharing world we're in, particularly the new communities, or the, the younger generations are into, that, into the whole concept of sharing and sharing the economics. Uh, recommendation, you know, go back to that point. There's nothing better than artists recommending other artists and other talent they like. Those are, those are great. If we, can, if we can megaphone those through um, platforms, that would be a, a great thing to get involved with. Um, last, before we go into questions from the, uh, from the audience, so my last question, imagine this is an end of term report card for, uh, for telco music bundling. What grade would you give it so far? If it was an end of term report card and you're saying, okay, how, how well, you know, how well has telco music bundling performed so far? What grade would you give it? What score? How well has it done? You know, in terms of meeting telco's needs, meeting record label needs, meeting the music services needs, growing the market, educating customers, I'll throw in a few considerations. On the one hand, it's been great at building audience. On the other hand, it's also been great at educating consumers that the most valuable product is something you get for free with data. I'll give it a B. OK. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, look, I think it's, there's, a, there's a few issues in terms of the legal structure. You know, we still live in a world where we have a mix of remuneration right uh, laws and property right laws. And you know, the control of the comes with property right laws, etc., makes it a complex scenario where you're trying to make these bundles work. So I think if we, you know, I spend a lot of time in Washington and in Brussels trying to convince lawmakers that we need to tweak legislation to effectively liberate copyright to make it much easier for platforms and telcos, etc., to engage with uh, copyrighted material. Um, until, if we can simplify that thing, I think we might get a higher rate card on, on the bundles. Right, OK. I'm, I'm, I'm with Ryan. I think that uh, there's a lot of aspects uh, around. And um, it's really difficult, I think, to see it. OK. <clears throat> right. The, um, the question is cleverly overlaid with the logo, so I'm going to try to decipher this. <laughs> um, are we now locked in a utility pricing model for music, or is there a way for content owners to sell at a premium? So I think this touches on a really important point, which is there are very few, if any, media businesses globally, or even subscription business of any kind, which caps the spending of its most valuable customers. You think about your pay TV, you think about your mobile phone, your, your provider will constantly be trying to get you to upgrade, to get you to have bolt-ons, to go and renew at a higher rate. Music took people who spent $30, $40 a month on, on albums and brought them all down and said you can have all of that and way more for just a fraction of the price at $9.99. Now, we have some $19.99 products in market. 
but they're pretty niche and it's really just around the quality of the audio. You really need, if you're going to convince people to pay more, you need to be bundling in a lot more with that as well, whether that be rich, you know, added value features like exclusive content, live streams from your artists, uh, the, the, the 60 second footage and things that Brian was talking about. So. We've got 9.99 as the price point in the market, which is too cheap for the super aficionados and too expensive for the mainstream. What gives? <laughs> Anyone like to grab that one? I think for super fans, there's obviously room to go up, but I think for everybody else, you know, we have to get them familiar with the product. For, we have to get them to understand the value of the product, and the key to understanding the value is to actually be using it. So I think we still have a long way to go before we are, we should be raising the price for most people. Oh, that, that definitely wasn't the question. It's giving people the ability to have higher price points. You know, so if you want to spend more, sure. because we, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can spend more on things like Tidal and the rest, can't you? You can spend 19 a month, is that yeah, right? And, and, but, and that's it, just to get essentially a higher quality audio. But what yeah. about, if the, you look at your pay TV subscription, there aren't just two price points. You look at your mobile phone plans, there aren't just yeah. two tariffs. There's a huge amount of thought and effort gone into building all these extra bits. Well, they're very flexible business models, aren't they? We'll go back to that point again. Our, 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 we're, we're in a very rigid, price controlled scenario and until such time as there is flexibility built into the system that will allow for variable pricing and allow for product mix uh, and provide, you know, it's, it, we're always going to struggle. And you're right, we know we're, the, we're, the capping and fixed price model is something that should be uh, abandoned. What are your thoughts on that, Alfonso? Well, um, as being the one Helping structure uh, the, what these the question, the question is, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that uh, if we are able to create premium content, if we can give more, give more access, give more interaction, uh, provide something that uh, is exclusive, that is different, there are some formats that will come with the future. We saw amazing, you know, um, demonstration how the uh, Oculus and, and 3D works. I think that uh, that will come on that direction and technology will give us uh, different formats to, to go there. But, uh, Talk about price is extremely, extremely difficult. OK. Any thoughts, Sasan? Yeah. Um, we gave away or have been giving away a lot of free data to actually stimulate growth on both freemium but also upselling standalone with using carrier billing. Mm -hmm. And we see that, um, of course, in those markets where it's extremely price sensitive, uh, I have been extremely su su surprised that we have had a very steep take-up uh, of uh, new customers coming in and streaming various services. Of course, most of these services, the first threshold is free, but also the willingness to try, try out different services, try and buy, and if we can also use carrier billing, making it very, very easy to, to experience the product to, to, to try it out. That's also where we can aid as an operator. And we've, been, we, we've seen clearly that uh, some of the markets, I assume it's the same in, in, yeah. in your emerging markets, that people, um, one thing is of course to pay a price premium for the music service. Another thing is the, the mobile internet data. So we have been helping doing that. And then again, the, the entire like price sensitivity and price perception, maybe then over time to try the, the products and we can do our, our share on that, we can build a much larger market and have a much stimulate the category growth in, in general. Okay, great. But so we need flexibility to we do. create new business models. <laughs> we do, we do. Um, uh, I'll do the, uh, the controversial question next and then move on to a, sort of a, a more blue sky one to finish on. So, can the music industry get back to health as long as the streaming distributors, i.e. Spotify, don't even make a profit? That's the non-controversial one? No, that's the controversial <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Spotify could be profitable tomorrow if we wanted to be in certain markets, but we're, trying, we're growing. Growing is... Um, uh, is still the priority. You know, this is still very much about, um, again, it's still very early days. You know, when you talk about mature, immature markets, the, the truth is they're all immature. Um, so uh, I would say I, absolutely, there's, it's all growth. Yeah, okay. And Alfonso, how, how 
just how important is streaming as a whole in the long-term future of record label business? Is it everything? Uh, um, uh, everything is a, is a uh, I mean, it's a, uh, I would say that it's super important. I think that uh, obviously streaming, what it uh, makes is uh, make a lot of people be part of this. I think that uh, if we go uh, and understand that uh, we came from physical products that were with a lot of uh, limitations of distribution, you know, and now basically you don't have these limitations on distribution of your back catalog, you don't have limitations on reaching every single person that has a smartphone. So more than 70% of the people on the evolved markets have a smartphone already. Uh, close to 43%, sorry, 37% have a smartphone already in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So while all the networks, all the penetration of smartphones, you know, are growing and growing, uh, there is a, a phenomenal a, a opportunity, not just for record labels, for, for Spotify, for carriers, because I believe that uh, uh, even going back to one of your comments, I think that there is a lot of opportunities on carrier building for carriers make money out of this, mm. definitely. And, uh, and uh, if we put all the pieces together, as I said at the beginning of, um, um, of this, it's like uh, we are just scratching the surface. We have uh, barely, what, 60, 70 million people, you know, and uh, we have uh, how, many, how many access on telecom broadband uh, uh, we have in the world? Yeah. Billions. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's a huge business if we know the, you know, the, the different, the different uh, parties in the value chain, we know how to, how to play it, right? Yeah, so I, th I like the, the bit as well, talking about you know, the limits of distribution that were there before. I think there's also another limit, which is the old recorded music business was all about selling music, which meant that your opportunity was strongest in the markets where you had strong consumer economies. Now, if it's much more about monetizing consumption, then you suddenly start seeing it's actually the, the markets which could be the most important music markets are the ones with the biggest populations, mm -hmm. not the richest populations, which is how it used to be. So we could end up seeing streaming creating a, a rebalancing of, of the balance of power in, in, in the recorded music business. So last question, and uh, I'll let Brian take this. We, uh, this is, we've had a lot of um, talk over the last sort of nine months or so about blockchain you know, and what role it could potentially play and one of the reasons why it appeals is because it can potentially bring a lot more transparency to, um, to music e economics. Um, now there's, there's a risk that we're, uh, sort of, we're still very much riding the, the wave of the hype around blockchain and you know, we're still trying to work out what the, you know, its, its potential really is. But from an artist's perspective, well, both from your perspective and the perspective of, of your artists, is that do you see blockchain as being potentially the foundation for a new alternative music industry? Well, I've, I'm a big blockchain fan, uh, personally. Uh, I, re I quite like that idea that, you know, you can, you can be a creator sitting on your, on your laptop or whatever, and uh, you create a film or a piece of music, and then you have a smart contract, and you publish it to the world, direct to platforms, direct to fans, and direct to whoever wants to use it, and you can monetize it, and the money comes back. So that vision, I love it, that concept, and uh, I think we're, if we, certainly in my own head, I've sort of got, you've got this sort of old world, uh, which we're all very immersed in, and let's call that old world at some level 30 million songs, but then we've got another, the future, which is building maybe another 70, 100, 200 million songs. Um, ha ha having blockchain uh, be the technology that enables that kind of smart contract operation for me is very exciting, but we are a long, long way away from that. Yeah. Uh, and no, undoubtedly, we'll go through a, a whole bunch of iterations before we get to see some bastard child of that vision. Right, okay. Great, okay, well, we're, we're pretty much out of time, so uh, thank you very much to the panelists for the conversation. I think if I were to summarize it up with a few key takeaways, one is, We've had a lot of progress so far with streaming music bundles, but there's clearly a long lot of distance to, to go with this yet. And I, I mean that in both, you know, both connotations, both there are still a lot of problems to fix, but clearly there's a huge amount of untapped opportunity. You could even make an argument the majority of the opportunity has been tapped. Emerging markets are going to become uh, a key battleground over the coming years, um, and we'll see the mix of indigenous players versus global players, both playing really important roles. Prepay is the huge untapped opportunity which we haven't yet 
worked out a way to properly fix, and that's potentially the next big problem for, for the music industry to, uh, to fix. Okay. Thank you.